Hello and welcome to Games from Folk Tales, a podcast that mixes historical research and tabletop role-playing settings. I'm your host, Timothy Ferguson. This week, this week, Canon Albrecht's Scrapbook. There's a little of Lord Dunsany's work left to do from his short story collection called 51 Tales, but that will wait for a poster day challenge. To replace him, it's time for a new author, M.R. James. James wrote about one ghost story a year to tell his friends in a circle about a fire as part of his Christmas celebrations. He's not as well known as Lovecraft or Poe, but he's one of the early parents of modern ghost stories. His lead characters would have suited his social circle, elderly men from universities who fossick around for ancient things. We'll be following his stories in the order he published them, so this first one is a little weaker than the others. Its structure is a little off. There are further notes as to the identity of the creature at the end of this podcast. The recording used in the podcast was released into the public domain by Peter Yearsley via LibriVox. I really enjoy Peter's recordings, and that may have swayed me toward the choice of M.R. James as our replacement author. Canon Alberic's Scrapbook saint Bertrand de Comminges is a decayed town on the spurs of the Pyrenees, not very far from Toulouse, and still nearer to Bagnères de Luchon. It was the site of a bishopric until the Revolution, and has a cathedral which is visited by a certain number of tourists. In the spring of 1883, an Englishman arrived at this old-world place. I can hardly dignify it with the name of city, for there are not a thousand inhabitants. He was a Cambridge man, who had come specially from Toulouse to see saint Bertrand's church, and had left two friends, who were less keen archaeologists than himself, in their hotel at Toulouse, under promise to join him on the following morning. Half an hour at the church would satisfy them, and all three could then pursue their journey in the direction of Uch. But our Englishman had come early on the day in question, and proposed to himself to fill a notebook, and to use several dozens of plates in the process of describing and photographing every corner of the wonderful church that dominates the little hill of Comminges. In order to carry out this design satisfactorily, it was necessary to monopolize the verger of the church for the day. The verger, or sacristan, I prefer the latter appellation, inaccurate as it may be, was accordingly sent for by the somewhat brusque lady who keeps the inn of the Chapeau Rouge, and when he came the Englishman found him an unexpectedly interesting object of study. It was not in the personal appearance of the little, dry, wizened old man that the interest lay, for he was precisely like dozens of other church guardians in France, but in a curious, furtive, or rather hunted and oppressed air which he had. He was perpetually half glancing behind him. The muscles of his back and shoulders seemed to be hunched in a continual nervous contraction, as if he were expecting every moment to find himself in the clutch of an enemy. The Englishman hardly knew whether to put him down as a man haunted by a fixed delusion, or as one oppressed by a guilty conscience, or as an unbearably henpecked husband. The probabilities, when reckoned up, certainly pointed to the last idea, but still the impression conveyed was that of a more formidable persecutor even than a termagant wife. However, the Englishman, let us call him Deniston, was soon too deep in his notebook and too busy with his camera to give more than an occasional glance to the sacristan. Whenever he did look at him, he found him at no great distance, either huddling himself back against the wall or crouching in one of the gorgeous stalls. Deniston became rather fidgety after a time, mingled suspicions that he was keeping the old man from his déjeuner, that he was 
regarded as likely to make away with St. Bertrand's ivory crozier, or with the dusty, stuffed crocodile that hangs over the font, began to torment him. "'Won't you go home?' he said at last. "'I'm quite well able to finish my notes alone. You can lock me in if you like. I shall want at least two hours more here, and it must be cold for you, isn't it?' "'Good heavens!' said the little man, whom the suggestion seemed to throw into a state of unaccountable terror. "'Such a thing cannot be thought of for a moment. Leave monsieur alone in the church? No, no. Two hours, three hours, all will be the same to me. I have breakfasted. I am not at all cold. With many thanks to monsieur.' "'Very well, my little man,' quoth Deniston to himself. "'You have been warned, and you must take the consequences.' Before the expiration of the two hours, the stalls, the enormous dilapidated organ, the choir-screen of Bishop Jean de Molian, the remnants of glass and tapestry, and the objects in the treasure-chamber had been well and truly examined, the sacristan still keeping at Deniston's heels, and every now and then whipping round as if he had been stung, when one or other of the strange noises that trouble a large empty building fell on his ear. Curious noises they were sometimes. Once, Deniston said to me, I could have sworn I heard a thin metallic voice laughing high up in the tower. I darted an inquiring glance at my sacristan. He was white to the lips. It is he. That is, it, it is no one. The door is locked, was all that he said. And we looked at each other for a full minute. Another little incident puzzled Deniston a good deal. He was examining a large dark picture that hangs behind the altar, one of a series illustrating the miracles of Saint Bertrand. The composition of the picture is well nigh indecipherable, but there is a Latin legend below which runs thus Qualitur es Bertrandus liberavit hominem quem diabolos diu volebat strangulare. How Saint Bertrand delivered a man whom the devil long sought to strangle. Deniston was turning to the sacristan with a smile and a jocular remark of some sort on his lips, but he was confounded to see the old man on his knees, gazing at the picture with the eye of a suppliant in agony, his hands tightly clasped, and a rain of tears on his cheeks. Deniston naturally pretended to have noticed nothing, but the question would not go away from him. Why should a daub of this kind affect anyone so strongly? He seemed to himself to be getting some sort of clue to the reason of the strange look that had been puzzling him all day. The man must be a monomaniac. But what was his monomania? It was nearly five o'clock. The short day was drawing in, and the church began to fill with shadows, while the curious noises, the muffled footfalls and distant talking voices that had been perceptible all day, seemed, no doubt because of the fading light and the consequently quickened sense of hearing, to become more frequent and insistent. The sacristan began for the first time to show signs of hurry and impatience. He heaved a sigh of relief when camera and notebook were finally packed up and stowed away, and hurriedly beckoned Deniston to the western door of the church under the tower. It was time to ring the Angelus. A few pulls at the reluctant rope, and the great belle Bertrand, high in the tower, began to speak, and swung her voice up among the pines and down to the valleys loud with mountain streams, calling the dwellers on those lonely hills to remember and repeat the salutation of the angel to her whom he called blessed among women. With that, a profound quiet seemed to fall for the first time that day upon the little town, and Denistoon and the sacristan went out of the church. On the doorstep they fell into conversation. Monsieur seemed to interest himself in the old choir-books in the sacristy. Undoubtedly, I was going to ask you if there were a library in the town. No, monsieur, perhaps there used to be one belonging to the chapter, but it is now such a small place. Here came a 
strange pause of irresolution, as it seemed. Then, with a sort of plunge, he went on, But if monsieur is amateur de vieux livres, I have at home something that might interest him. It is not a hundred yards. At once, all Deniston's cherished dreams of finding priceless manuscripts in untrodden corners of France flashed up, to die down again the next moment. It was probably a stupid missile of Plantin's printing, about 1580. Where was the likelihood that a place so near Toulouse would not have been ransacked long ago by collectors? However, it would be foolish not to go. He would reproach himself forever after if he refused. So they set off. On the way, the curious irresolution and sudden determination of the sacristan recurred to Denistoun, and he wondered in a shamefaced way whether he was being decoyed into some purlieu to be made away with as a supposed rich Englishman. He contrived, therefore, to begin talking with his guide, and to drag in, in a rather clumsy fashion, the fact that he expected two friends to join him early the next morning. To his surprise the announcement seemed to relieve the sacristan at once of some of the anxiety that oppressed him. "'That is well,' he said quite brightly. "'That is very well. Monsieur will travel in company with his friends. They will always be near him. It is a good thing to travel thus in company, sometimes.' The last word appeared to be added as an afterthought, and to bring with it a relapse into gloom for the poor little man. They were soon at the house, which was one rather larger than its neighbours, stone-built, with a shield carved over the door, the shield of Alberic de Merlion, a collateral descendant, Deniston tells me, of Bishop Jean de Merlion. This Alberic was a canon of Comminges from 1680 to 1701. The upper windows of the mansion were boarded up, and the whole place bore, as does the rest of Comminges, the aspect of decaying age. Arrived on his doorstep, the sacristan paused a moment. Perhaps, he said, perhaps after all, monsieur has not the time. Not at all. Lots of time. Nothing to do till tomorrow. Let us see what it is you have got. The door was opened at this point, and a face looked out, a face far younger than the sacristan's, but bearing something of the same distressing look. Only here it seemed to be the mark not so much of fear for personal safety as of acute anxiety on behalf of another. Plainly the owner of the face was the sacristan's daughter, and, but for the expression I have described, she was a handsome girl enough. She brightened up considerably on seeing her father accompanied by an able-bodied stranger. A few remarks passed between father and daughter, of which Deniston only caught the words said by the sacristan, "'He was laughing in the church,' words which were answered only by a look of terror from the girl. But in another minute they were in the sitting-room of the house, a small, high chamber with a stone floor, full of moving shadows cast by a wood fire that flickered on a great hearth. Something of the character of an oratory was imparted to it by a tall crucifix, which reached almost to the ceiling on one side. The figure was painted of the natural colours. The cross was black. Under this stood a chest of some age and solidity, and when a lamp had been brought and chairs set, the sacristan went to this chest and produced therefrom, with growing excitement and nervousness, as Dennis soon thought, a large book, wrapped in a white cloth, on which cloth a cross was rudely emblazoned in red thread. Even before the wrapping had been removed, Deniston began to be interested by the size and shape of the volume. Too large for a missal, he thought, and not the shape of an antiphona. Perhaps it may be something good after all. The next moment the book was open, and Deniston felt that he had at last lit upon something better than good. Before him lay a large folio, bound, perhaps, late in the seventeenth century, with the arms of Canon Alberic de Molion, stamped in gold on the sides. There may have been a hundred and fifty leaves of paper in the book, and on almost every one of them was fastened a leaf from an illuminated manuscript. 
such a collection Deniston had hardly dreamed of in his wildest moments. Here were ten leaves from a copy of Genesis, illustrated with pictures which could not be later than A.D. 700. Further on was a complete set of pictures from a Psalter of English execution of the very finest kind that the thirteenth century could produce, and, perhaps best of all, there were twenty leaves of unseal writing in Latin, which, as a few words seen here and there told him at once, must belong to some very early unknown patristic treatise. Could it possibly be a fragment of the copy of Papias on the words of our Lord, which was known to have existed as late as the twelfth century at Nîmes? Footnote. We now know that these leaves did contain a considerable fragment of that work, if not of that actual copy of it. Return to the text. In any case, his mind was made up. That book must return to Cambridge with him, even if he had to draw the whole of his balance from the bank and stay at Saint Bertrand till the money came. He glanced up at the sacristan to see if his face yielded any hint that the book was for sale. The sacristan was pale, and his lips were working. "'If monsieur will turn on to the end,' he said. So monsieur turned on, meeting new treasures at every rise of a leaf, and at the end of the book he came upon two sheets of paper of much more recent date than anything he had seen yet, which puzzled him considerably. They must be contemporary, he decided, with the unprincipled canon Alberic who had doubtless plundered the chapter library of Saint Bertrand to form this priceless scrapbook. On the first of the paper sheets was a plan, carefully drawn and instantly recognisable by a person who knew the ground, of the south aisle and cloisters of Saint Bertrand's. There were curious signs looking like planetary symbols, and a few Hebrew words in the corners, and in the north-west angle of the cloister was a cross drawn in gold paint. Below the plan were some lines of writing in Latin, which ran thus. Responsa duo decimus dec mille sescenti nonagenta quatuor interrogatum est inveniamne responsum est invenies fiamne dives fies vivamne invidendus Vives, moriarne in lecto meo, ita. Answers of the 12th of December, 1694. It was asked, Shall I find it? Answer, Thou shalt. Shall I become rich? Thou wilt. Shall I live an object of envy? Thou wilt. Shall I die in my bed? Thou wilt. A good specimen of the treasure hunter's record quite reminds one of Mr. Minor Canon Quatremain in Old St. Paul's, was Deniston's comment, and he turned the leaf. What he then saw impressed him, as he has often told me, more than he could have conceived any drawing or picture capable of impressing him. And though the drawing he saw is no longer in existence, there is a photograph of it, which I possess, which fully bears out that statement. The picture in question was a sepia drawing at the end of the seventeenth century, representing, one would say at first sight, a biblical scene, for the architecture, the picture represented an interior, and the figures had that semi-classical flavour about them, which the artists of two hundred years ago thought appropriate to illustrations of the Bible. On the right was a king on his throne, the throne elevated on twelve steps, a canopy overhead, soldiers on either side, evidently King Solomon. He was bending forward with outstretched sceptre, in attitude of command. His face expressed horror and disgust, yet there was in it also the mark of imperious command and confident power. The left half of the picture was the strangest, however. The interest plainly centred there. On the pavement before the throne 
were grouped four soldiers, surrounding a crouching figure, which must be described in a moment. A fifth soldier lay dead on the pavement, his neck distorted, and his eyeballs starting from his head. The four surrounding guards were looking at the king. In their faces the sentiment of horror was intensified. They seemed, in fact, only restrained from flight by their implicit trust in their master. All this terror was plainly excited by the being that crouched in their midst. I entirely despair of conveying by any words the impression which this figure makes upon any one who looks at it. I recollect once showing the photograph of the drawing to a lecturer on morphology. A person of, I was going to say, abnormally sane and unimaginative habits of mind. He absolutely refused to be alone for the rest of that evening, and he told me afterwards that for many nights he had not dared to put out his light before going to sleep. However, the main traits of the figure I can at least indicate. At first you saw only a mass of coarse, matted black hair. Presently it was seen that this covered a body of fearful thinness, almost a skeleton, but with the muscles standing out like wires. The hands were of a dusky pallor, covered like the body with long coarse hairs and hideously taloned. The eyes, touched in with a burning yellow, had intensely black pupils, and were fixed upon the throned king with a look of beast-like hate. Imagine one of the awful bird-catching spiders of South America translated into human form, and endowed with intelligence just less than human, and you will have some faint conception of the terror inspired by the appalling effigy. One remark is universally made by those to whom I have shown the picture. It was drawn from the life. As soon as the first shock of his irresistible fright had subsided, Deniston stole a look at his hosts. The sacristan's hands were pressed upon his eyes. His daughter, looking up at the cross on the wall, was telling her beads feverishly. At last the question was asked, Is this book for sale? There was the same hesitation, the same plunge of determination that he had noticed before, and then came the welcome answer. If monsieur pleases. How much do you ask for it? I will take, I will take two hundred and fifty francs. This was confounding. Even a collector's conscience is sometimes stirred, and Deniston's conscience was tenderer than a collector's. My good man, he said again and again, your book is worth far more than two hundred and fifty francs. I assure you, far more. But the answer did not vary. I will take two hundred and fifty francs, not more. There was really no possibility of refusing such a chance. The money was paid, the receipt signed, a glass of wine drunk over the transaction, and then the sacristan seemed to become a new man. He stood upright, he ceased to throw those suspicious glances behind him, he actually laughed or tried to laugh. Deniston rose to go. "'I shall have the honour of accompanying monsieur to his hotel,' said the sacristan. "'Oh, no, thanks. It isn't a hundred yards. I know the way perfectly. And there is a moon.' The offer was pressed three or four times, and refused as often. "'Though so monsieur will summon me if, if he finds occasion. He will keep the middle of the road. The sides are so rough.' "'Certainly, certainly,' said Deniston who was impatient to examine his prize by himself, and he stepped out into the passage with his book under his arm. Here he was met by the daughter. She, it appeared, was anxious to do a little business on her own account, perhaps like Gehazi, to take somewhat from the foreigner whom her father had spared. A silver crucifix and chain for the neck? Monsieur would perhaps be good enough to accept it? Well, really, Deniston hadn't much use for these things. What did Mademoiselle want for it? Nothing, nothing in the world. Monsieur is more than welcome to it. The tone in which this and much more was said was unmistakably genuine. 
so that Deniston was reduced to profuse thanks and submitted to have the chain put round his neck. It really seemed as if he had rendered the father and daughter some service which they hardly knew how to repay. As he set off with his book they stood at the door looking after him, and they were still looking when he waved them a last good-night from the steps of the Chapeau Rouge. Dinner was over, and Deniston was in his bedroom, shut up alone with his acquisition. The landlady had manifested a particular interest in him, since he had told her that he had paid a visit to the sacristan, and bought an old book from him. He thought, too, that he had heard a hurried dialogue between her and the said sacristan in the passage outside the salle à manger, some words to the effect that Pierre and Bertrand would be sleeping in the house, had closed the conversation. All this time a growing feeling of discomfort had been creeping over him, nervous reaction perhaps after the delight of his discovery. Whatever it was, it resulted in a conviction that there was someone behind him, and that he was far more comfortable with his back to the wall. All of this, of course, weighed light in the balance as against the obvious value of the collection he had acquired. And now, as I said, he was alone in his bedroom, taking stock of Canon Alberic's treasures, in which every moment revealed something more charming. "'Bless Canon Alberic,' said Deniston, who had an inveterate habit of talking to himself. "'I wonder where he is now. Dear me, I wish that landlady would learn to laugh in a more cheering manner. It makes one feel as if there was someone dead in the house. Half a pipe more, did you say? I think perhaps you're right. I wonder what that crucifix is that the young woman insisted on giving me. Last century, I suppose. Mm, yes, probably. It is rather a nuisance of a thing to have round one's neck. Just too heavy. Most likely her father has been wearing it for years. I think I might give it a clean-up before I put it away. He had taken the crucifix off, and laid it on the table, when his attention was caught by an object lying on the red cloth, just by his left elbow. Two or three ideas of what it might be flitted through his brain with their own incalculable quickness. A pen-wiper? No, no such thing in the house. A rat? No, too black. A large spider? I trust to goodness not. No. Good God! A hand, like the hand in that picture. In another infinitesimal flash he had taken it in. Pale, dusky skin, covering nothing but bones and tendons of appalling strength. Coarse black hairs, longer than ever grew on a human hand. Nails, rising from the ends of the fingers and curling sharply down and forward, grey, horny, and wrinkled. He flew out of his chair with deadly, inconceivable terror, clutching at his heart. The shape, whose left hand rested on the table, was rising to a standing posture behind his seat, its right hand crooked above his scalp. There was black and tattered drapery about it. The coarse hair covered it as in the drawing. The lower jaw was thin. What can I call it? Shallow, like a beast's. Teeth showed behind the black lips. There was no nose, the eyes of a fiery yellow, against which the pupils showed black and intense, and the exulting hate and thirst to destroy life, which shone there, were the most horrifying features in the whole vision. There was intelligence of a kind in them, intelligence beyond that of a beast, below that of a man. The feelings which this horror stirred in Deniston were the intensest physical fear, and the most profound mental loathing. What did he do? What could he do? He has never been quite certain what words he said, but he knows that he spoke, that he grasped blindly at the silver crucifix, that he was conscious of a movement towards him on the part of the demon, and that he screamed with the voice of an animal in hideous pain. Pierre and Bertrand, the two sturdy little serving-men who rushed in, saw nothing, but felt themselves thrust aside by something that passed out between them, and found Deniston in a swoon. They sat up with him that night, and his two friends were at Saint-Bertrand by nine o'clock next morning. He himself, though still shaken and nervous, was almost himself by that time, 
and his story found credence with them, though not until they had seen the drawing and talked with the sacristan. Almost at dawn the little man had come to the inn on some pretense, and had listened with the deepest interest to the story retailed by the landlady. He showed no surprise. "'It is he! It is he! I have seen him myself!' was his only comment, and to all questionings but one reply was vouchsafed. "'Deux fois je l'ai vu, mille fois je l'ai senti.' He would tell them nothing of the provenance of the book, nor any details of his experiences. I shall soon sleep, and my rest will be sweet. Why should you trouble me? he said. Footnote. He died that summer. His daughter married, and settled at Saint-Papou. She never understood the circumstances of her father's obsession. Return to text. We shall never know what he or Canon Alberic de Molion suffered. At the back of that fateful drawing were some lines of writing which may be supposed to throw light on the situation. Contradic Salomonis cum demonio nocturno, Albericus de Molione delineavit, v. Deus in adiutorium, P.S. qui habitat, Sancte Petronde demoniorum effugator, Indicede pro me miserimo, primum iudi nocte, duo decimus, dec, mille sescenti, non aginta, quatuor, uidibo mox ultimum, pecari et passus sum, plura adhuc passurus, dec, viginti novem, mille septigenti unum, i.e., the dispute of Solomon with a demon of the night, Drawn by Albrecht de Molion, versicle, O Lord, make haste to help me, psalm, Whoso dwelleth, 91, Saint Bertrand, who puttest devils to flight, pray for me, most unhappy. I saw it first on the night of December the 12th, 1694. Soon I shall see it for the last time. I have sinned and suffered, and have more to suffer yet. December the twenty ninth, seventeen o one. The Gallia Christiana gives the date of the canon's death as December the thirty first, seventeen o one, in bed of a sudden seizure. Details of this kind are not common in the great work of the Samarthani. I have never quite understood what was Deniston's view of the events I have narrated. He quoted to me once a text from Ecclesiasticus: "Some spirits there be." that are created for vengeance, and in their fury lay on sore strokes. On another occasion he said, Isaiah was a very sensible man. Doesn't he say something about night monsters living in the ruins of Babylon? These things are rather beyond us at present. Another confidence of his impressed me rather, and I sympathized with it. We had been last year to Comminges to see Canon Alberic's tomb. It is a great marble erection with an effigy of the canon in a large wig and soutane, and an elaborate eulogy of his learning below. I saw Deniston talking for some time with the vicar of St. Bertrand's, and as we drove away he said to me, I hope it isn't wrong. You know I am a Presbyterian, but I, I believe there will be saying of mass and singing of dirges for Albrecht de Molion's rest. Then he added, with a touch of the northern British in his tone, I had no notion they came so dear. The book is in the Wentworth collection at Cambridge. The drawing was photographed and then burned by Deniston on the day when he left Comminge on the occasion of his first visit. End of Canon Albrecht's Scrapbook in M. R. James's Ghost Stories of an Antiquary, Volume 1. In Ghosts and Scholars, issue number 6, Helen Grant tries to identify the demon in this story. After a digression into the suggestion that the creature is female and related to Lilith, she suggests it's from the Testament of Solomon. Demons from this source have already appeared in some hours' magical material, um, Realms of Power, Infernal, page 62, for example. Hunt notes that there is a demon which has the same powers as the one described in the Testament, 
uh, but not the shape. There are also others which have the shape, but they need to be stretched a little to have the correct powers. As such, I feel free to make one up out of whole cloth in the statistics given on the blog that accompanies the podcast. Please leave feedback about the selection of M.R. James as our new author. See you next week.